The title of my message is Living for the One Who Died. So this is part of our sermon series, Indomitable Faith. And I think that there's some stuff in here that's super relevant that will be a blessing to us. Now, if you think about your life and the decisions that you make, you will come to the conclusion that many, much of our living as individual human beings, so much of our living as individual human beings is actually living for others. We live for others. So we, we go to work, and yes, we benefit from the toil of our labors, but we also go to work to feed our families. We go to work to bless our children, our spouses. We go to work as employers, perhaps, and yes, we benefit from it, but we also are a blessing to our employees, those of you that are business owners. Yeah, you're making money off your business, but you also are a blessing to others because you have the opportunity to provide them with gainful employment. We love our neighbors. We speak truth to our neighbors. We seek to meet our neighbors' needs. Much of life, many of the decisions that we make, the way that we spend our money, the jobs we pick, the ministry we do as a church, are for the benefit of other people in this life. It, it blesses them economically. It best blesses them relationally and socially and spiritually. In short, we live for the living around us. But we also live for the one who died, that is Jesus. And what's fascinating about living for the one who died is we know that the one who died eventually conquered death and was resurrected, sits at the right hand of the Father and now offers human beings eternal life. And when we in this life live for him, we enable others to live eternally. So we go to work and we toil in order to bless others in the here and now. We engage in horizontal tasks here on planet Earth in order to bless others horizontally. But as Christians, we also live vertically. We live for eternity. And in doing so, we bless others eternally. We present to them the opportunity to humble themselves in faith and surrender to the Lord Jesus Christ. We live for the living and we also live for those who will live in eternity. Christians then live in such a way that others might live eternally. This is the message I think that we see in this passage. Christians live in such a way that others might live eternally eternally. So entering into this text, I would like to discuss our motive, the need to live a good example, and also our love for Christ and where that love comes from and what anchors that love. So let's begin with verse 11. Verse 11 of 2 Corinthians chapter 5 reads, therefore, knowing the fear of the Lord, we persuade others. So we're going to learn here that reverential awe motivates us to engage in gospel ministry so that we might bless others eternally. Rever rever reverential awe of God motivates us. Therefore, knowing the fear of the Lord, the passage says. Now, when the scriptures speak of the fear of the Lord for the believer... This is not intended to mean that we should live our lives in like a crippling fear of God. Perhaps you grew up with that notion of God. You're a Christian, but God is like this giant in the sky with a big wooden mallet. And he's just waiting for you to mess up. And when you mess up, he's going to bring that hammer down quick and crush you. So you live your life with this Fear, like a, a mean, abusive father kind of God. This is not what the passage is speaking about. This is not the kind of reverential fear that motivates us. This is not the fear of the abusive dad who comes home and you hear his work boots coming up the stairs and he's about to slap you around because mom said you did something wrong that day. This is not the kind of fear that motivates us in ministry, but rather the kind of fear that we exercise as Christians is reverential awe. Reverential awe 
of God. What kind of a God, after all, would offer his one and only son to save us? If you had the opportunity to play the role of God for a day or two, would you offer that which is most precious to you, your child, in order to bless those that have rebelled against you? Of course you wouldn't. But this is the God that we serve. This is the God that walks among us and permitted us to be abused. Or permitted himself, I should say, to be abused by us. Tortured. Ridiculed. Nailed to a cross. This is the God that sustains a world within which evildoers taunt him. Taunt him. Make fun of him. Use his name in vain. This is the God we're talking about, folks. This holy God, he didn't need to put up with this. He wasn't lonely, thinking, you know, I'm kind of lonely. It's been an eternity or two, and I think I better create some people to help me along here because it's getting a little, little boring, being all by my lonesome. He was per- perfectly satisfied in and of himself, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But this God lovingly created us and even permitted himself to be abused, and misused and made fun of. This is our God. Now, by faith, we have encountered him, and we know that in spite of our great sin, his grace is greater. So we walk with Christ, and we worship him, and we love him, and we're so thankful for his provision, and we're thankful that we have hope in dark times. Are we not thankful for that? We're thankful for his ongoing daily provision. We're all here. That means we haven't starved to death yet. He's provided for us. He's guided us. Therefore, knowing the fear of the Lord, having reverential awe of God, what do we do? Oh, we just worship him and hang out and enjoy him by ourselves? No. What does the next statement say? We persuade others. We urgently and convictionally and willfully seek to introduce others to the God that has so richly blessed us. It is his awesomeness that persuades us to persuade others. And brothers and sisters, we don't stop trying to persuade others when we're too tired to, or when we're fed up, or when people have pushed back. The God that we serve is so beautiful and wonderful that it is worth spilling out our lives for him, sacrificing ourselves for him so that others might live. Now, if you are unmotivated to serve God in this way and you're trying to figure out why, like, man, I I know he's awesome, but for some reason, I, I get a little scared standing for Jesus. I'm a little awkward sharing my faith with my family and friends, and I'm I'm, I'm having trouble putting my finger on it. It might be because you have too reduced a view of God. It might be that you have a reduced view of God, and in order to up your view of God, you need to get into the Holy Scriptures and read about the beauty and grandeur of God. You need to increase your worship of God. You need to sacrifice more for God. I mean, think about it, brothers and sisters. We have something to offer the world that can lead to their eternal salvation. What more motive do we need? We got a guy in Toronto that's so motivated to sell brisket that he's willing to get arrested to keep his business open. And yet there are Christians that have in their hands and in their heart the eternal message of the gospel. And they start running when someone tweets a negative tweet at them or sends them a snarly email. What is it that keeps us motivated to serve the Lord? Reverential awe that we serve the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And if our salvation means anything, it should affect our willingness 
to engage in persuading others and telling people about the wonder of the God that we serve. How do we do this? Very practically, the passage goes on to instruct us that we use our example to point people to God. You know, the Bible is powerful. It's like a double-edged sword. It can penetrate right through to the inner man, the Bible teaches us. But God also uses the testimony of his people. And if you're a Christian, I'm sure you've had many times in your life where you hear someone give their testimony, you're like, man, that just profoundly impacted me. Well, that's how God works. God uses the testimony of his people to bless others. The scriptures are filled with the testimonies of God's people, as I read to you earlier in Acts 20. Here's what the Bible says in verses 11 and following, but what we are known are it, but what we are is known to God, and I hope it is known also to your conscience. In other words, the true you, God knows the true you, but hopefully the true you is also evident in your conduct to others. We are not commending ourselves to you again, but giving you cause to boast about us so that you may be able to answer those who boast about outward appearance and not about what is in the heart, which is, by the way, the method of the world, right? It's all the externals that matter. It's all what you've accomplished, how good-looking you are, how athletic you are, how rich you are that matters. People are fascinated with that stuff. You can be the biggest loser in the world, and totally shallow in your character and personality, but if you drive a fancy car and have a wonderful job and a beautiful spouse, people are like, wow, I want to be like you. I'm going to put your poster on the wall of my bedroom. This is the world we live in. But that's not the Christian perspective. And then verse 13 says, for if we are beside ourselves, it is for God. If we are in our right mind, it is for you. So there's three things I want to extract from this text for us to consider. The first is when it comes to our example, because you can try to live a good example and people are like, you're being a bad example. Well, first of all, we're reminded that our God's opinion of us matters most. So that, that matters the most. So we're not so pragmatic that we only do and say that which others applaud. God's opinion of us matters the most. And the text says, but what we are is known to God. We're known to God. You can fake it till you make it before men. But God knows the true you. Is it possible for God to declare one of his servants righteous? Of course it is. Sometimes we have this notion, well, I'm not perfect. And none of us are. We won't be this this side of heaven. I'm not perfect, so I don't really want to, I don't want to ever presume that I'm a good example. Well, what about Job? Was Job not called one of the most righteous men that was in the face of the earth? Does that mean he was sinless? Does that mean he was like Jesus? No. You can still be weak and imperfect, but be considered righteous by God. And that should be our goal, to be righteous by God, before God. Again, not perfect, but righteous. And if you are a believer, you should be. You should be righteous before God. When you sin, immediately confess your sin. Walk humbly before God. And by God's grace, by the way, there are so many righteous men and women in this church. It's just super awesome to see. And we should expect that and anticipate that because God is doing a good work among his people. So when others question your example, know this, it, that it is God's view that matters most. I'm, I'm emphasizing this because sometimes in my life, as I have done something that I absolutely know is right, others have said, that's wrong. And you start thinking, oh, did, did I do something wrong? But again... Ultimately, if we're right before God, that's what matters most. And yet, at the same time, our conduct and our example is a blessing to others and it points people to God. Our example of godliness is, more, is of greater value than our, our appearance. Now, there's nothing wrong with trying to look half decent. So those of you that are in the dating years, maybe you're going on a first date this week, little advice, brush your teeth, comb your hair, 
put on some snazzy clothes. Nothing wrong with that. If you're getting married, you know, you don't show up in a pair of grubby overalls. Nothing wrong with having some consideration for your appearance. If you're going for a job interview, you don't quote, you know, show up looking like a guy that just walked out of a cave, hair all over the place, unbrushed beard, raggedy clothes. We're, we're not so heavenly minded that we place no emphasis whatsoever on externals. But when we weigh externals to internals, internals win every time. God is far, far more concerned with the heart and with our godliness. And apparently, if I'm reading this text properly, that speaks volumes to people. To the point that the Corinthian church, as they shared the message that Paul and his colleagues had shared with them, they could kind of brag on Paul's example and Silas's example and say, you know, these guys didn't just preach it, but they lived it. What is in the heart matters the most. The circumstances, um, the circumstances of Paul's time, if you read verse, uh, I guess it would be 13 in particular, where it says, for if, we are beside our, for if we are beside ourselves, it is for God. And if we are in our right mind, it is for you. The circumstances here, and this is the third point, suggest that it might have been that Paul, in seeking to be a good example for Christ and preaching the gospel, was at times accused of being maybe crazy. People looked at him and levied nasty accusations against him. This is probably what the meaning of this phrase is, for if we are beside ourselves, not that he was beside himself, but if it appears that we're sort of, I don't know, out of control or kind of weird, not acting normally. Or if it appears that we are not of right mind, it is for God, it is for you. I think the message that God is seeking to communicate to his people here is that when we live for God, and we do that which is right and should be normal, at times people will accuse us of being crazy, of not being sober-minded. So for example, you know, I, I'm pretty convinced, as those of you that have been around here for a while know, that the way our world has handled COVID-19 is unacceptable. Because what we've done is we've focused and focused, focused on at great expense and without consideration for so many other things, one single problem, bringing the, the number down to zero. And we're so focused on that, that the tunnel vision is so exceedingly great that we're prepared to turn a blind eye to the increase in opioid use. Oh, we'll deal with that later. And turn a blind eye to people that are killing themselves. Oh, we'll deal with that later. And somehow just ignorantly ignore the fact that in a tangible world, it's just not possible to shut down tens of thousands of businesses to bring the number down to zero and possibly expect that we'll ever recover from that. So I'm not a virus denier, but I've pleaded and called upon people. We have to have a more balanced approach. You can't just focus on one thing, risk and reward. You get away so many things. This to me seems so common sense. But you're accused of in, in taking that position of being a nut. Well, you're a granny killer. You want to kill all the people in our nursing homes? Or you're a cove idiot. In other words, you're, you're crazy. You're a nut. You're not of right mind. You seem out of control. 
You know, ultimately, God knows the truth. And ultimately, we're going to stand before God. This is why the text says in verse 13, if we are beside ourselves. So I think, again, he's speaking, he's speaking in such a way that indicates what people thought of him. If we are beside ourselves, if you look kind of crazy, it is for God. And if we are in our right mind, it is for you. So again, this passage is calling us to be a good example. But knowing that in being a good example, some people are going to accuse you of things. Some people are going to misunderstand. But ultimately, when we follow our consciences and the word of God and bring that which is clear into that which is muddled and befuddled and perhaps ambiguous, God will bless our efforts. The third truth is that love compels us. Love compels our ministry, our public engagement. The text says in verse 14, for the love of God controls us. That word means compels, motivates us, puts checks and balances on it. Because we have concluded this, and here we have the, the, the good old-fashioned gospel of Jesus Christ rearticulated for us. That one has died for all, that's Jesus, therefore all have died. And he died for all, that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who for their sake died and was raised. You might have to read that two or three times because it's interesting, some interesting grammar there, but you get the point. What compels our ministry? The love of Christ for us. What is the gospel? The gospel is the message that Jesus died for us. And that means that all who are in him have died too. We've died to our old ways, our old priorities, our old self. We've received the gift of eternal life. We now live and we will live for all of eternity. And the reason then for our ministry, the reason why we go out persuading others of the message of the gospel is ultimately for God's glory. Let me read verse 15 again. And he died for all that those who live, that is his people, this is you, if you're a Christian today, this is for you, might no longer live for themselves. It's not just your rights, your opportunities, but it's based upon your love for others. You want to see them come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. For him who for their sake died and was raised. Now, ultimately, the one who benefits from the proclamation of the gospel and the steadfastness of his church is God. We often say in our church, the mission of God is the glory of God. And we have to emphasize this. You know why? Because even in the church, we can start to see the gospel as primarily being to our benefit. Can't we? It's like, I remember as a little kid, I don't want to go to hell, so I better run to Jesus. Okay, well, Jesus is the solution to that problem. But ultimately, God wanted to save me, not just so that I would be saved, but to, so that he would be glorified. It's for his sake that I became a beneficiary of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, you will never endure in the Christian faith. Hear me clearly. You will never endure in the Christian faith if your motive is merely self-preservation. Never. Self-blessing, God's blessing, or security. You know why? Because at times you're going to call all those things into question. You're not going to feel very secure. You're not going to feel very loved by God in the moment. There's going to be times like the psalmist testified to, where you're going to feel kind of like abandoned by God. Those motives will be tested. So if you're kind of into church and into Jesus because well, I, it benefits me, blesses me, makes me feel better, makes me feel secure, there's going to be times you're not feeling all that. So the motive then is not just the self, but it's for God. We do not live for ourselves, but we live for God, for his honor and for his glory. It's interesting that in the broader ethos of scripture, there's lots of teaching on this. 
Um, the gospel writer calls us to carry our cross. We carry our cross. We walk in the suffering of Christ. As Christ, Christ didn't suffer so we could avoid it. Christ suffered and then called us to suffer with him. Think about that. Now, Christ died so that we would not ultimately have to die. But Christ didn't suffer so that we would never suffer. Not in the here and now, at least. Christ died so that we wouldn't have to die, but in calling us to saving faith, we must carry our crosses. And sometimes we're put to the test. One of my favorite characters in scripture, because he's just so real, is Peter. I mean, you got to love Peter. I think if he was around today, I'd want to be a friend of Peter. It's kind of a man's man. He's honest. He's without hesitation. He's bold and courageous and all of that. But Peter denied knowing Jesus when he was confronted by the authorities that were threatening his life. He wasn't willing to lay down his life for Christ. But later, by God's grace, he confesses that and is restored to fellowship and goes on to be a dynamic figure in the early church. And we believe from church history that he was actually crucified upside down on a cross because he didn't think of himself as being worthy enough to be crucified even in the way of his Savior. So in the end, he got it right. That's the point. But in the Gospels, he is portrayed, at least for a period of time, as a person who was bold and brash, but then not, not willing, really. When push came to shove, not willing to carry his cross. Well, we need to think about that in our own lives, because again, we can say, oh, the reason why I love God is because he protects me from harm, and he provides for me, and I always experience his goodness every day. But sometimes we have to sacrifice it all for him. But we do so because one day we will be raised to life. Do you believe that, by the way? Do you actually believe in the doctrine of the bodily resurrection? How many of you here believe in that? How many of you here allow that doctrine to affect your emotional and mental response to the challenges of life? A doctrine is meant to be appropriated, not just, oh, it's true. We're going to defend the doctrine of the bodily resurrection. It's meant to give you hope in fear, hope in death. It's meant to put perspective on risk. It's meant to affect you. And frankly, I think we need to allow it to affect us a little more. And to make sure the world knows that we actually believe in this doctrine that we say we believe in. Let's do our best then to persuade others of these wonderful truths to the glory and honor of the King.